Uh, what's prompted this talk is because sometimes when I get referrals uh, with a PSA, it's um, a little bit clouded what is the rationale behind ordering that PSA. And I, I'm trying to uh, relate some of the symptoms that we see in urology with uh, how it, it might affect PSA. That green squiggle there is the actual uh, molecule that uh, is responsible for the talk, which is PSA, which was uh, sort of seen in, um, in the semen and uh, uh, sort of uh, purified in the 80s, which, um, which uh, has revolutionized prostate cancer treatment. But getting back down to basics, what actually is PSA? It's a naturally occurring enzyme that the prostate makes and puts it in the ejaculate. If you're actually to test the ejaculate, it's there in, in mega doses. So we're used to looking at PSAs in our patients in the blood of you know, anywhere from four to 10 uh, nanograms per mil, which warrants a referral. But if you test their semen, you'll find it's 200,000 to five and a half million nanograms per mil. So that's where it belongs. But what we're testing is actually how much is leaking into the bloodstream. So really, we're looking at conditions where the PSA leaks into the bloodstream. So there are various uh, reasons why we use PSA, and the most obvious one is actually to look for prostate cancer. That's why it was developed. But some people use it for monitoring things like prostatitis, and it can be a surrogate also for uh, BPH or prostatic volume. And that's why, of course, uh, the PSA uh, reference ranges rise with, with uh, the age because with, with the aging man, the prostate uh, becomes bigger and, and generates more PSA. But uh, that little table there is to show what does the PSA mean in, in relation to prostate cancer. So as the PSA goes higher, um, if you were to biopsy a man with that particular PSA, what is the rate of finding prostate cancer? So PSA in the blood is um, higher in uh, patients with prostate cancer because the characteristic of prostate cancer is a defective basement membrane in the, uh, in the uh, cells. Um, now, out of the patients with um, prostate cancer, the PSAs tend to be higher if the prostate cancer is in, in a part of the prostate called the transition zone. Um, but there are other things that can cause the PSA to rise as well. I've mentioned prostatitis, which can be both bacterial or, you know, it can be any uh, cause of inflammation. Uh, we do biopsies and if you were to test the PSA after a prostate biopsy, you'll find it's quite elevated. Prostatic infarction sometimes happens. No one thinks about that, but it often uh, presents uh, uh, with urinary retention. Uh, the actual urinary retention itself can lead to a raised PSA. And uh, funnily enough, ejaculation. So a man who ejaculates can raise their PSA maybe by one point. So that's why we often uh, give them guidance to abstain from uh, sexual activity prior to them uh, uh, sampling their PSA, maybe by a couple of days. So a trauma, a trauma in, the, in the form of a rectal examination uh, or prostatic massage for those sadistic urologists that want to, uh, to uh, elicit um, bacteria from, from the prostatic secretions. Now bike riding is a very controversial thing. Um, I've, I've been there through this bike riding uh, um, event and, and in the start they used to think, oh, well, bike riders would have a slightly higher PSA. The, the literature is a bit conflicting it kind of depends on which bike riders you look at. Uh, the bike, sort of amateur bike riders that don't know how to ride their bike and sit on their bike, probably, maybe it does uh, increase the PSA. If you had to do a study on professional bike riders where they're actually sitting on their bottom, not their prostate, it probably doesn't uh, uh, increase the PSA. So it is controversial. We do think about that. Maybe just to be safe, if you're not sure, recheck the PSA after a period of abstaining from bike riding. And of course, uh, enlargement of the prostate or BPH. So I've got a picture there of the prostate on ultrasound and um, that one's a big one, but they get much bigger. So of course, what goes up can also fall. 
PSA can fall if the prostate becomes smaller. Now it can be ablated by TURP or removal or surgery. Um, also reduced hormone stimulation, in other words blocking testosterone. A lot of drugs that do that, uh, including ones that we give uh, purposely to castrate for prostate cancer. But very commonly used for hair loss is a drug called finasteride or uh, Proscar or Propecia. Um, but uh, these drugs, uh, finasteride, dutasteride, are also used for patients with BPH outflow symptoms in order to relieve the outflow symptoms. And also, a, a man can be hypogonadal naturally. Uh, there's a phenomenon, uh, androgen decline in the aging male or Adam. Um, the older man can have a lower PSA because of their lower testosterone. Um, and also, if, there is a, if there's an inflammatory cause, removal of that inflammatory cause can result in a lower PSA or declining PSA then. <coughs> so how is PSA handled in the body? I mean, it, it goes up, it comes down. It comes down because um, you clear it through the liver and the kidneys. It takes about two to four days for it to uh, go down by half, and that's why when we have a patient after radical prostatectomy, we're not going to check their PSA the next day. We wait for maybe a month and a half before it uh, declines down to negligible levels. If you, de if you check it too early, it might give you a false sense that the cancer is uh, recurrent. So PSA actually comes in two forms, a conjugated or a bound form to protein, and that's cleared mainly by the liver. And it's thought that the other form, which is the free serum PSA, is excreted uh, by the kidneys. So I'm going to talk about some of the common uh, reasons why the PSA might uh, be elevated. So urinary tract infection or prostatitis. So most commonly, um, you'll see a PSA, or I might be referred to someone with urinary symptoms of dysuria, most often frequency, maybe a fever, systemic uh, symptoms, a bit of blood maybe, uh, and sometimes urinary retention. So that person's thinking maybe this guy's got UTI or prostatitis and they'll go and do a PSA, thinking prostate PSA, let's, let's check it all. But unfortunately, your, your result's gonna be a little bit clouded. Perhaps it'll be artificially uh, raised and that patient's going to be concerned about their prostate cancer now. So how do you tell if, if it may be a UTI? Obviously, uh, you know, past UTIs or sexually transmitted infections. A history of poor stream or inadequate emptying might, might sort of tip you off that they might have factors which predispose to uh, infections. So in a case where you've got an elevated PSA and you really want to make sure that, that it's not spurious and it's because of an infection, of course, do an MSU. Uh, sometimes doing a PCR for things like chlamydia and gonococcus might help. Um, I wouldn't go and do a, a rectal examine, uh, examination with acute prostatitis because it's often extremely tender. Um, there is a risk of sepsis causing a, a bacteremia when you're doing this. But if you are going to do one and you feel the prostate, prostate in the setting of prostatitis will be very inflamed, boggy, uh, and, and often quite smooth. Now, the usual level of PSA that you would expect for a patient with bacterial prostatitis, you know, it's usually around about 20, but I've seen it go up to maybe 70, 80. But if you're getting something in the thousands, that's way too high, and maybe you need to uh, think of other, other causes. So, of course, uh, urinary tract infection, prostatitis, is treated with antibiotics, usually guided by your culture, um, and then prevention of a subsequent uh, infection uh, doing an ultrasound often is a, is a good thing in males because it's usually a sign of outflow obstruction and, uh, and not clearing the, the bladder very well. Um, if you are going to follow up the PSAs, I wouldn't be in a hurry to do it too quickly, maybe in a, in a month, maybe three months. Uh, hopefully that will return back to normal and, and then your patient's going to be reassured so sometimes urologists will see someone who's had a prostatic infarct. They're not going to present saying, dear doctor, I've uh, uh, come in with a prostatic infarct. 
what they really present with is an inability to go to the toilet, much like uh, a very severe prostatitis uh, situation. So that patient often goes into retention and then you're going to do a TURP on them. And when you do it, their chips end up all bruised and red and you go, aha, there's been some sort of bleeding inside the prostate causing it to become inflamed and, uh, and give all these symptoms. So much like um, patients with prostatitis, if you are going to check the PSA, the PSA is going to be elevated. Um, diagnosis also can be done on the histopathology because the, uh, the prostate has a lot of inflammatory cells and maybe evidence of previous infection as well. So I've got some slides of uh, BPH, so that's an MRI. Now usually the prostate tends to be smaller than the, um, the, the greater trochant and the femoral head. So that one's a very big one on the MRI. But the bit of the prostate that gets enlarged with BPH is the so-called transition zone, which is in the center of the prostate. So patients with BPH get a lot of what, we, uh, what, what other things we see with prostate, which is outflow symptoms, um, which is often an a obstructive symptom, which is a decreased stream or inability to start their stream and hesitancy, or more like a irritative symptoms, which is the urgency and the, uh, the nocturia, going to the toilet more often, can't hold it in sort of thing. So the tip-off with the PSA pattern here is usually if you've got the history, the PSA tends to rise pretty gradually. And this is the problem because, uh, you know, BPH often doesn't have much symptoms and you get it, you know, a whole lot of uh, normal people have, have BPH, a whole lot of patients with uh, prostate cancer have BPH as well. So how do you differentiate between those ones and the, and the guys with prostate cancer? Now it is said that with BPH, the PSA tends not to go uh, high, uh, does not tend to rise as aggressively as with prostate cancer. Now, these cutoffs are somewhat arbitrary because obviously there are going to be exceptions to the rule. So it depends on where you draw the line as to how, how stringent you want to be. So if you're going to be doing yearly PSAs on, on your patients, you know, some aggressive people say, well, you, you need to think about prostate cancer if it goes up by more than 0.3 in a year. Uh, a, a more lax uh, uh, sort of cutoff might be 0.7 in a year. But really, I don't think there's any uh, true answer. It depends on how, how stringent you want to be. Um, so this is why it's a bit confusing when the PSA is in that 4 to 10 range. I mean, if you've got a really outlandish PSA, then you've got a very high chance of prostate cancer. If you've got a low, low PSA, then you've got very low chance of either. But in the in-between group, you've got cancer mixed in with benign uh, PSA. So this is why there is a significant role these days for doing a uh, rectal examination, trying to find those uh, asymmetry or lumps there. And in the end, sometimes you cannot differentiate the two, and then you're, you're forced to discuss with the patient the, the uh, need for a biopsy. So some refinements about the PSA looking at prostate cancer versus BPH are PSA velocity that we've mentioned, but also this phenomenon that we've, uh, that we've uh, just recently seen called free to total ratios um, with, the, with the PSA. And then this, um, this phenomenon of PSA density, which is actually measuring the prostate volume and trying to calculate how much PSA per volume of prostate, which uh, is an interesting exercise. So what I've got there in that, in that table is um, what does the PSA actually mean? So at various age groups. And this is why you know, there's, there's a lot of confusion because if you're, if you're trying to exclude people just on PSA, there's a lot of overlap. You cannot do that. Of course, at the very high end, you can. You know, people at a 95%, you know, you've got a very high chance of uh, prostate cancer, but what about all these other people? So free to total ratios is, is a, a concept of different types of PSA. It's thought that with prostate cancer, because cancer is an abnormal variant of the normal prostate, that the actual PSA that it makes 
doesn't function quite like the normal PSA. So when it's in the bloodstream, uh, this, uh, this PSA can either be complex to uh, albumin and other protein, uh, or, or it can be uh, free, free in their serum. So the ratio between those two PSAs is uh, different for, for patients with prostate cancer versus BPH. So low PSA, uh, low free to total ratios, low free to total ratios go along with a higher chance of prostate cancer. So there's actually a continuum. So unlike on our pathology uh, reports where, you know, over 25, you're right, you still have a chance of prostate cancer at that, at that level. But uh, the chance is much less than if you've got a very low PSA. So, you know, you can sort of counsel your patient or reassure your patient of relative risk, but not, not like an absolute risk. Mm. But uh, the, go, the take home message is, you know, sort of below nine or 10, it's pretty high risk. Uh, over 23 or over 25, it's pretty low risk. And in between, maybe it doesn't really help you. You have to look at other factors. Okay. Now this uh, thing of PSA density is very hard to do without an ultrasound of the, of the prostate. But the, the theory goes like this. If you have a prostate cancer, your prostate is going to be making much more PSA per volume than if it's benign. So you're looking at how much PSA in the blood compared to how many mils of prostate you have. So if you're, if you're uh, higher than 0.15, then you have a higher index of suspicion uh, of prostate cancer. And the good thing about this is that it's quite useful in that range of men where we're not sure what's going on of, of between four and 10. And they're the ones, of course, uh, you know, before it becomes metastatic. So, um, however, unfortunately, you require like a transrectal ultrasound. And I guess once you do a transrectal ultrasound, you may might as well just do some biopsies at the same time if to, to, to really clinch the diagnosis. So it is a, a somewhat invasive uh, way of checking your PSA. So what do I actually do? So when I see someone, they've been referred with some symptoms and uh, elevated PSA, I try and backtrack and see, well, what do those symptoms try and represent? So maybe I try and work out if there's a UTI or prostatitis, and then treat whatever it is. And I won't get too worried about some elevation in PSA. Usually I'll counsel the patient about the natural history of prostate cancer, which is somewhat comforting. And then I'll, I'll repeat the PSA uh, after doing a rectal examination. The timing really depends, I mean personally, on the anxiety of the patient. Some people uh, don't mind waiting for about three months. Other people, you know, want to get it all checked out very quickly. Um, however, in the end, sometimes you're not going to be able to discern between benign causes and malignant causes, and then you're going to have to do a biopsy. Mm. The reason why I actually do uh, repeat the PSA is actually to uh, try and reduce the biopsy rate, because about half the time or a third to half the time, you can actually avoid that biopsy and the PSA goes back to historical levels. Uh, but it is important to uh, counsel the patient when that PSA goes back to normal that you know, it doesn't necessarily exclude them from having a cancer. It just means that they're uh, not going to have a significant cancer. Um, again, on that repeat PSA, you want to counsel about uh, ejaculation, maybe spending a week off the bike if you can help it. And uh, I often do a MSU at that same time. Okay, so I think I've run out of things to say. <laughs> <laughs>